Okay, friends, get a cup of coffee. We're going to go through my uh, what I consider an advanced landscape editing workflow in Luminar Neo in this video. And so uh, this is not going to be a short video, but hopefully it gives you a good inside uh, look, if you will, at what I do, how I approach and edit. Because uh, for me, editing is really about control. And so there's a lot of different steps that I take. So I want to show you the before photo, which is this photo that I shot in Iceland on the uh, Luminar camp there uh, this past August. Uh, if you look on the right hand side, you can see all the different tools that I use. And so this is all about controlling the light and essentially dodging and burning quite a bit. And I do that with develop and I'll talk about that here in the video. But these are all the different steps I take. And so when I say advanced landscape editing, I want to be clear that doesn't mean it's hard or complicated or anything like that. By advanced, I mean it requires a lot of steps. There's a lot of things to think about when you really want to make an impact on an image because it is about controlling really every part of the image. And so I'm going to walk through that process. This is the before photo. That's the after photo. Quite a bit of changes, uh, as you can see. And of course, you can see all the tools that are uh, included. So I'm going to revert to original and I'm going to pop over to the tools menu and I'm going to go ahead and get started. So for me, it's a raw file. I always start with develop raw. And in this case, I want to audition a camera profile. And so these basically provide an alternative interpretation of the raw data. So if you come uh, and audition these, that's what the word I like to use, as you hover over these, they give you different ideas of what this uh, base image can start like. I end up deciding on camera vivid. You saw the end result. It's fairly vivid, which I like with my landscapes. And I wanted to add some mood. And so I'm going to do that, but then the next thing I do is I come in and I do end up bumping up contrast and so um, and pulling down the highlights and adjusting the shadows and things like that. So this is kind of kind of basic, really, for for lack of a better term. But I always start with develop raw because it's using that rich raw data and it gives you a lot of control over the overall look of the photo. Now, many times I'll do blacks and whites as well. I actually don't really need them in this image, and uh, I'm going to go straight to the temperature, which is going to be cooler. So I just like to type that in. Uh, it's a lot quicker and easier really than trying to uh, drag a slider to a specific temperature value. A little bit of vibrance, a little bit of sharpening, so maybe a 20. And I like to go into optics and here I'm going to use the auto distortion correction and you'll see that adjust that um, potential distortion that kind of existed there in the raw file. So if you look at the before and after with raw develop, we've come up pretty good ways really. And I think the photo looks a lot better. Now, the way I think about editing is the first thing I do is global adjustments. Develop Raw is the first global adjustments. And if you're new here by global, I mean it impacts the entire image. That's the first one 100% of the time. The second one, about 99% of the time, is actually super contrast. And so I'm going to uh, come in here and uh, essentially I just experiment with this tool. And I move these sliders around. I usually do a 25 to 30 or something like that in terms of each of these, and then I start playing with the balance. Uh, in this case, uh, I took the highlight balance all the way to 100. You can see the impact that it had on the sky, which for me was too bright and kind of distracting from really the key focus of the image, which is the waterfall and the mist kind of flowing down the canyon. And so after some experimentation, I landed on these values with super contrast before and after, mostly taking care of that sky. Now, speaking of sky, I see a few spots up there, so I'm going to go ahead and click Erase and Remove Dust Spots. Let that do its magic, and then we'll jump back into the edit. Okay, those dust spots are removed, and we're ready to go. So uh, that's my base edit. Uh, two tools, Develop Raw and Super Contrast, taking it from that to that, cools it off, uh, enhances the mood a little bit, adjusts the light slightly, uh, but those are my global edits. And this is when I start getting into local edits, and that's really my approach is global first, of course, uh, and then local, and then I actually end up normally doing some more global edits at the end, and we'll get to that at the end of this video. But the uh, the local edits are effectively controlling different specific parts of the image, uh, and usually that's with develop. There are other tools that I use as well, but develop is the one that I use the most. So I'm going to go ahead and get develop, and the first thing I want to do is slightly drop the exposure of the sky. The easiest way, in my opinion, to do that is with a linear gradient. And so I'm going to drag that, something like that. I like kind of a generous fade, and that's the area between these uh, upper and lower line. That's where the transition or the fade of the effect kind of dissipates into the image. And so something about like that 
looks pretty good. And what I'm going to do is just drop that exposure. And so that's a, about a negative six or something like that. Six, two, six, one, something like that. All I'm doing is just darkening the sky a little bit. So that is effectively dodging and burning. I'm just using a linear mask and I'm using develop and the exposure slider to control the dodge and burn instead of the actual dodge and burn tool. And I don't really use the dodge and burn tool. I use develop 99% of the time because I just think it works well. And for something like the sky, especially, it's just easier to get that big of an area. Now, having done that, the next thing I see is I think these hills are a little bit too bright. So once again, this is going to be another dodge and burn, or in this case, burn, which is the darkening. So I'm going to open up develop. I'm going to go into the brush mask. So that's masking and then brush. And here I like to drop the opacity or the strength on the brushes and just kind of paint it in at a little bit reduced strength. So I'm going to come over here and just paint over some of these because they're just a little bit too bright for me. So maybe something like that. And I come in and I just kind of tap my mouse around just to kind of get it looking the way I want it to look. And then once again, I come over here to exposure and slightly drop that. Now, you're not seeing as huge of a decrease because remember, I'm using a lower strength brush. So my strength was reduced to about 60. So I'm getting 60% of that. And I've had people ask me, why don't you just drop the exposure less uh, and not use a different strength brush? Just use a strength of 100. And the answer is, I don't know, it just feels like a lighter touch. I don't know how to explain it, uh, but in all my experimentation, um, I just, I like to drop the strength of the brush uh, on some things like this one, and then drop the uh, exposure in this case. So it's just, uh, it's just a, a way that I do it. I don't know that it's the right way, or if there's a, a numeric or scientific or technical reason why it's better. It just feels better to me. Uh, and I do edit by feel. But if you look at the before, those hills, uh, I like them and I like all the texture in them and things like that, but they're a little distracting. Now they're a little less distracting because I want to, I really want to focus the viewer's attention on a landscape like this. The focus is really that waterfall coming down and then kind of going with some of the mist. And those hills you see before and after, a little bit too bright. So I darken them a tiny bit and I think that looks fine. And uh, now I'm done with that instance of develop. So I just click it to close it. And then, of course, I can click it to open it again. And that's something that you'll find that I do. And you saw this because I showed you all the tools that I used before I started this video. Um, I used develop, I don't know how many times, six or eight maybe on this photo. And that's really common for me when I'm doing uh, what I call a detailed edit. And that's why I call this an advanced uh, video or advanced uh, editing workflow. And that's because there's a lot of steps. That, like I said, they're not hard uh, and they're kind of repetitive, to be fair. Uh, but they're easy. It's just thinking about what you want to do to the photo and taking your time to get it right. And this is probably my fifth iteration of this edit. I've done this edit multiple times. And every time I come up with something slightly different, because I kind of change my mind after I sit on it and I come back with fresh eyes and decide I want to do something different. Uh, but here I'm going to go masking again and brush and a lower strength brush. So like 60, 62, that's often where I am, again, just for feel, um, unless I'm doing something really light, I'll do really low strength, like 20 or 30, but most of the time I'm around 60 or 70. And here, what I'm going to do is brush into the falls uh, and kind of around in here. So something about like that, and maybe kind of down in here and a little bit of that river. So something about like that. And I've just painted over that. And as you can guess, what I'm going to do here is slightly bump that exposure because I need that area to be brighter. And you will notice what happens here is that it's also kind of enhancing that fog. Now, another way to do that is with contrast and not positive contrast, but if I remove contrast, you can see that it gets a little bit mistier and foggier. See how that happens? If I add contrast, it gets a little more intense. But when I drop the contrast and I do like a negative 30 or something here, it kind of lightens that up. It creates a little bit more haze almost, which is fitting for that because it's a waterfall and mist and there's all this fog uh, in the sky. Now highlights, I'm going to play with these a little bit. I actually might bump those up a little bit and I'm actually going to bump up the whites slightly as well. So that is just kind of brightening that area and bringing a little bit of life to it. So if you look at the before and the after, it just looks quite a bit more, uh, it's more visible, right? And being the focal area of the photo, I want that to stand out. And one of the key ways that you can make a part of a photo stand out is by making it brighter. 
Uh, and so that would be the use of dodge and burn to darken certain things, brighten other things. And it's all about drawing the viewer's attention. But before and after, I think that looks pretty good. And I think that fits in really well with the mood of the overall photo. Okay, having played with quite a bit of the light, I want to do a little bit with the color. So I'm going to go into the color tool. Uh, and I go into HSL a lot. I don't really use saturation and vibrance that much. I, uh, I prefer to get into HSL. So in the hue I'm going to start with, I'm actually taking the yellows, and I go to about a 70 here. And all that's doing is pushing them closer to the green. And then I'm going to take the green and go to about a 25. And that's pushing them to more green, kind of closer to blue. And if you look at the color of the grass on the hills, there's the before. It's more of a mustardy yellow, which I don't really like. It doesn't feel right to me. So I'm making it a bit more green, and that's by changing the hue of the yellow and the green. And you might look at it and think, well, just change the green because that's green. But the truth is, anytime you adjust green, you get a huge impact on the green by adjusting the yellow. There's just a, a lot of yellow in green, really in any photo I find. And so that's one of the reasons why the hue on the yellow, I went so far to the right. So having done that, that is the hue. And the other thing I want to do is go into saturation. And that's the next drop down. And what I want to do is I'm going to drop the saturation of both of those, uh, about 25 or so, simply because I don't want them to be too distracting. The overall final color in the image, I think looks nice, nice balance of color. But I want to tone that down just a little bit. So I take both of those down 25. So now if you look at the overall kind of color feel of especially those distance hills on either side of the river. There it is before and there it is now. So I basically made it more green and less saturated. So I'm going to close color and I've got to flip my page here. I've got all these notes about all the different moves that I do because there's no way I could remember, uh, remember all this for a video. So I've been playing with uh, color and light. I've been dodging and burning quite a bit with develop and I played with color, which is really a local adjustment. And the reason I call that a local adjustment is because I was messing only with a couple of color channels. It wasn't a saturation or vibrance or hue shift for the whole image. I left the blues alone, uh, for example, but I just adjust the yellows and greens. So to me, that still falls in with a local adjustment, even though I did not use a mask. Uh, speaking of mask, there's another thing I really want to pull the viewer's attention to, and that's this rock right here. Uh, right below the waterfall. So again, that's going to be develop, and I'm going to go into masking and brush, and once again, a lower opacity like 60, 65. I think that's fine. And all I'm going to do is paint over this rock in this area here because I want to bring a little bit more attention to it. And so something about like that, and in order to get attention, you can brighten things, which is exactly what I'm going to do. So something about like that, so maybe an eight or now, maybe, maybe one full stop, something about like that. Um, I'm going to leave that there. Uh, it's also really green, so I'm actually going to take the tint and drag that slightly to the right. Well, I say slightly, it's like a 35. It just pulls away from the green a little bit. And I'm going to pull down some of the saturation and vibrance simply because I don't want it to be like a, a crazy over-the-top green. And it was getting kind of intense. Uh, in fact, I might brighten that a little bit more. So something about like that, but if you look at the before and the after, again, just controlling the view and the viewer's eye to draw attention to that bit of the photo. And that's why using uh, develop again and again and again on different little parts of the image is so powerful. I may use develop on the sky. I used it on those distant hills. I used it on the waterfall and the river. I used it on the rock. Lather, rinse, repeat. Just focus, pick an area, do something. That's why develop is so powerful because it's dodging and burning by adjusting exposure. But you have all these other tools, including temperature, tint, saturation, vibrance, all those kind of things that can help you really uh, draw the viewer's attention. That's why I like it better than just the straight up dodge and burn tool. So now having done that, there's another tool that's really good at bringing attention to a particular area. And that for me is Accent AI. Now I love Accent AI, but I rarely, and I've said this plenty of times in other videos, I rarely apply it across the entire photo because it can be too much. Um, I say rare because maybe I'm going to do that again in this photo, but the first thing I want to do here is really draw attention, more attention to that waterfall area. So in this case, I'm going to get a radial gradient. I'm going to go ahead and click and drag that. And I love that the radial gradient now automatically defaults to inside. I did a video about that recently, which is there. I just love that because for years, literally since Neo came out, I've been having to uh, just come in and invert the mask, which 
you know, it's one click. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but honestly, when you use radial mass as much as I do, over time it starts to add up and it starts to feel like kind of a hassle. So I'm really glad that they listened to us and just inverted that. And uh, I've been begging for that for a long time, and I know many of you have as well. So um, let's keep the cards and letters coming to Skylum about the things we want them to improve and adjust and change in Luminar because they do listen. So my radial mask is in place. That's pretty good. And I'm going to start dragging this slider. And I end up going to about a 30 or 32, something like that. Just pop in that area, giving a little bit of oomph, a little bit more focal, uh, you know, fo make it more of a focal point, I guess. But if you look at the before and the after, nice little pop. Anytime I'm using a radial mask, and I didn't talk about this when I was showing it, but I want that edge to fade. So you want to, the inner circle or oval and the outer circle or oval, you want to have some distance between them. You don't want it to be really tight and compressed because then your, uh, your effect just fades off pretty rapidly, like a, what I call a light switch transition. But in this case, it fades into the photo, and I think it looks better because it fades into that mist, and uh, just overall, I think it looks a little bit better. So before and after. And again, that's a local adjustment because I masked it in. So I'm still on local adjustment, even though I'm using uh, multiple tools. Didn't mean to click erase. What I do want to go into next is atmosphere. And this photo has a lot of atmosphere already. It's one of the reasons I was so excited to stand there and take it. And also why I've had so much fun editing this photo several times, as I've mentioned. But there's a lot of atmosphere already. And using the atmosphere AI tool can really help add to that mood overall. And what I end up using here is mist. And I go to about a 25 or 30, something like that. It's called a 28, but I don't want it everywhere because you see what it's doing to the photo. It's uh, brightening up my sky, which I don't want. I darken the sky on purpose, but I do want to accentuate some of the mist around the falls and on those distant hills. So that's a mask and that's a brush. And I'm going to drop the strength a little bit, maybe 74. I'm going to make my brush a little bit bigger and I'm going to come in and just, you know, basically doodle let's call it a doodle where I'm just kind of uh, dropping a little mist here around these falls uh, and that sort of thing and just kind of enhancing the overall mood. And so if you look at the before and the after, that just kind of enhances that mood overall and just kind of adds a little bit of a, well, it adds mood. I'm, I'm running out of terms here. Sorry, I'm, my adjective uh, supply is low, but um, I'm just enhancing the mood and mist uh, or atmosphere, I guess, is a great way to do that. So you already have all this misty stuff coming off the falls, plus there are low-lying clouds and all that. I've just added to it, but controlling it with a mask is, allows me to really get where I uh, get it where I want it to go. Also, I use 100 on softness. That's, again, that faded soft edge. Whereas otherwise, if I didn't, I'd have a really hard stop and it wouldn't blend as well into the photo. So think about that. Anytime you're masking, uh, things in. You have a soft brush because you want that edge to be kind of a fade. It's the same idea, same concept as a linear gradient with that fade that we did at the beginning of the sky or the radial gradient that we did around the falls with that soft edge. That's the same thing on a brush mask. It's just creating that fade so that it blends more subtly into your photo and doesn't have an abrupt change. So before and after with atmosphere. And I think I might actually take the amount down just a little bit maybe a little bit like that. So maybe 23, um, season to taste. That's always how this works. But just experiment and have fun until you figure out what you want your photo to look like. So now having done that, I feel like I'm done with local adjustments and we've come a really long way. We did our global adjustments, we did local adjustments. And as I get toward the end of my edit, and I am approaching the end, uh, for those of you that are running low on patience, um, because this is a long video, um, for me, there's a few things I like to do to wrap things up. A photo like this, I like to come in with mystical and I just hit the entire thing with like a 32. Uh, and that just creates a little bit more mood. The other thing it does, if you notice, it creates a little bit more contrast. So the dark stuff gets a little bit darker. The bright stuff gets a little bit brighter and it creates a little bit of soft overall look. I think that fits. I'm going to go back to Axon AI. And I mentioned this earlier where I said I pretty much 90 plus percent of the time I control it with a mask. Sometimes at the very end of my edit, I like to come in and just give it a little, just a little push. And that's just a, that's an 18 and maybe I'm going to go less. Maybe I'll go 15 and that's global applying across the entire image, but it does a lot, but it's a nice little kick at the end, like a dash of spice at the end of your cooking to kind of give a little extra oomph to your photo. So before and after, it's just a little something that I like. And another uh, final kind of step I like to do is come in to develop one more time. And this is global, no masking here. And that is just to play with contrast. 
And by adjusting contrast, you can see that's really making that waterfall pop. And if I hit the J key, which I like to do, that activates kind of the, the blue and the red overlay. The blue, you can see a tiny bit down here. That means it's complete black. If there was a red overlay, it would say, hey, this is blown out. And it's getting pretty bright on the waterfall, but it's not blown out. So I don't uh, need to keep the J key on, but I like to check that. You can also tell, of course, by looking at the histogram, there's nothing that's running off the right-hand edge. So you're fine in terms of being in safe territory. But a little extra oomph at the end, Accent AI of like 15, and coming back with Smart Contrast of 17 gives me a little bit extra kick towards the end. And then usually my final step is coming in with a vignette. And I like to choose Subject. And my subject is, uh, it's really the waterfall, but I tend not to put my center of my vignette, which is what you're choosing when you choose Subject. You're choosing what the center of the vignette is. Instead of it defaulting to the center photo, I'm gonna take it down here somewhere about like that. So slightly off center not the center of the photo, also not the center of the waterfall. And what I want to do here is just darken that a little bit. So that's just kind of creating those slightly darker edges, and then maybe just a tiny, tiny bit of inner light just adds a little bit more mood there. And so if you look at the before and the after, there we go. That's my full uh, workflow and all the things that I think about. Global edits, local edits, and then coming back with more global edits. Local edits are either tools that have specific control like HSL within the color tool or masking things primarily for me, which is develop. But if you look at the before and after, you can see we came a really, really long way, added a lot of mood, added some drama, really bumped up the overall look of the photo. And frankly, I'm quite pleased with it. Before and after, before and after. So advanced techniques are really about global edits first, which for me are develop raw and then super contrast. And then second step is focus on local edits, which is the use of develop with masks, usually at a reduced strength again and again and again. And that's just dodging and burning mostly. So controlling the light, making some things darker, making some things lighter. Uh, but then other tools like Accent AI, Atmosphere, things like that, we can come in and mask those. Uh, and then wrapping up with more global edits, which in this case was like Mystical and Accent AI again, and a little bit of Smart Contrast, and then of course a vignette to wrap it up. But you can take it a landscape or any photo really from kind of interesting and dramatic to I think more impactful, just taking your time doing controlled edits over time and um, experimenting to make sure you find the best look for your photo. That's my advanced landscape workflow. That's really how I approach a scene like this. Hope it gives you some insight into my editing process. And uh, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, leave them down below. I'll be back soon with more videos. Thanks, my friends. You guys take care. And until next time, adios.